Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Chris LeComp, although you may have known me as Referee or Mr. Official throughout the years. Today, Mario Nasta joins me one more time for the final installment in this series on Assistant Refereeing, where he shares with us his seven steps to being a better AR. For a quicker list of these seven steps, please see ARing 201. For an explanation of the rules AR seems to know that govern beaters and their bludgers, please see ARing 101 or ARing 111. For an explanation of how and when to make calls as an assistant referee, please watch ARing 102 or ARing 112. Now let's dive in. Here are the seven steps to being a better AR by Mario Nasta. Mario, thank you for joining and for imparting your knowledge upon the world. My pleasure. Anything we can do to uh, increase the AR pool, increase the skill level, is, is good for the sport. Yeah, so I wanted to start things off uh, just talking about kind of the breakdown of a ref crew across the board. I think it's something that isn't discussed enough um, and sometimes can be a little confusing, especially for newer refs, what they should have each of their refs doing, um, whether it's a newer HR or a newer AR themselves. Um, but yeah, so overall, uh, what I found the most effective is going to be your HR right there, they're controlling, they've got the whistle, they're, they're in charge of kind of the, the overall pace of the game more than anyone else. They should be watching the Quaffle game um, predominantly and, and kind of keeping the peripherals of, of the beater game in their focus, uh, but really specifically watching the ball carrier in the Quaffle game so that they can kind of educate fouls and stop and start play as, as, as they need. The LAR on the flip side should be also watching the Quaffle game for the most part, um, but looking more at the off-ball chasers, getting that secondary perspective in the quaffle game so that between the HR and the LAR, if they're spread out on opposite sides of the field, they really get an entire encompassing view of what's going on with the quaffle carriers um, and just anybody kind of pushing or, or shoving on the sidelines at anywhere near the sides. That leaves the space for the ARs uh, to be specifically focusing in on the beat game, right? Um, if you're an AR, it's synonymous with beat ref for most people for a reason. You should be watching the beaters, seeing what's going on, watching the bludgers, really paying attention to that half of the game. Then finally, you've got your goal refs. They should be, you know, no matter what, in a position where they can see if a, a shot goes in one of the hoops. That is their number one priority at all times. While they're doing that, they can look for any, you know, minor fouls and things like that and, and watch a quaffle to see if it goes off the boundary line to put their hand up and kind of signal to help out the head ref, but really their number one goal at all times should be watching to see if a ball went in the hoop or not. Lastly, you've got the snitch ref. They should be watching the snitch, really self-explanatory. No matter what, they need to put themselves in a position where they can tell if a catch is good or not. Uh, they should be leaning on the ARs in the area to really educate a lot of those beat calls so they can be focusing primarily on the snitch itself. Right, as a snitch ref, I find that most snitch refs can handle the seekers and the snitch runner, but once any beaters start entering, or two beaters start battling, it's impossible to watch both the seekers, the snitch runner, and also watch that. So it's really helpful when ARs shift over to help watch that kind of stuff. Yeah, 100%. As an AR during snitch run pitch, you need to migrate and support your snitch ref as much as possible, right? It's it's not their responsibility to ever be calling out beats. They are, they are there for the snitch you need to go in and play your part with that part of the game. Right, snitch refing's a full-time job on sound. 100%. I think it's really interesting yeah. that the, you want the LAR watching off-ball quaffle game. I know a lot of refs who use the LAR as another AR, but yeah, but who want to, uh, uh, to assist with adjudicating beater fouls. So what what's your reasoning for not putting them on the beater game? Yeah, so... I've, I've been in plenty of games, both as a player and a ref, um, where things are happening off-ball chasing-wise, whether it's, it's you know, shoving, um, illegal picks, jersey pulls. There's, there's a lot of nitty-gritty stuff that can go on in the quaffle game that isn't right center focus on the quaffle carrier. And as a ref, if you are watching the quaffle carrier, which, you know, the HR should generally be doing, it's very, very hard for you to see those other things happening. Um, and it's an area of the game that I think very much gets overlooked. Uh, by having your LAR on the opposite side of the pitch as you and having them primarily focus on the off-ball chasers, they can still kind of see what's happening in the with the quaffle itself. That'll be in their peripheral. Um, but mostly they can see everything going on with the passes. And that also helps that when you get those plays where a quick pass happens and then 
like a foul happens right on the receiving end, they're already watching that. So you have a great view of, of as the position changes, as the field switches, those kinds of things. It just gives a much better trade and continuous flow between the HR and the LAR uh, in the Quaffle game specifically. All right. And cool. if your ARs are, you know, truly just watching the beating game, they should be able to handle it on their own. I think part of the breakdown there and why oftentimes HRs ask their LARs to support in the beater game is because the HRs don't trust the ARs to do it themselves, which is fair because a lot of some of the newer ARs let their vision, you know, stray over to the Quaffle game. If they are just watching the beating game, the LAR is indeed in that area. Right. I know even more experienced ARs like myself. Experienced, not good, but experienced. <laughs> um, I, I routinely find myself watching the Quaffle game and having to like actively push myself towards the beater game to watch it. Yeah. And I mean, everybody does it. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm guilty of it too. I like to think I'm a decent AR. Like I, I, this is what I predominantly do. I've played beater my whole life, but at the end of the day, the Quaffle is what scores. So sometimes that's more exciting. If you're an AR, you're not there to enjoy the game. You're there to educate the game, right? You got to watch the beaters and it can be tough, but you got to hold yourself to that. So your first tip here is to move. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, there is no feeling worse for a coach or a captain on the sideline of a game than to turn to the field and see a AR or an L any ref really just standing still in a corner of the pitch when the ball's on the other half, right? Um, there's there's no excuse for it. It's not just a, a Quidditch thing. It's an any sport thing, right? If you're there as a ref, you're there to make calls. To do that, you need to see what's happening. And to see what's happening, you need to be near the play. It's, it's just right. that simple. None of us are none of us are birds. We don't have don't have the vision to see it from the other end of the field. You gotta you gotta hop on your horse and get down to the other end as the ball moves back and forth. Um, with that in particular, uh, like to talk about a little bit about positioning when it comes to ARs. Obviously, you want to be moving up and down the field every single play as the ball switches from offense to defense. Um, in the AR game, at the beginning of the game, you should touch base with your peers uh, if you're on the same side, right? Um, and there's two of you. One of you should always be at the in line with the beaters closest on defense, closest to hoops. The other should be in line with the offensive beater um, closest to half, right? Kind of be at the boundary lines, the edges of where the beater game is. One of you watching, you know, more defense focused, the other watching more offense focused so you can truly encompass and observe everything that happens in the beater game. Um, on, the, on the flip side, if you're by yourself, which often happens, especially during maybe central pitch or things like that as the game transitions, try to be as centered in the middle of the play as possible, or try to look for an area of the field where you see two beaters near each other from opposing teams, because that's the most likely area for a play to occur, and, and you obviously want to be watching for those kinds of situations. Right, and uh, to add a shameless plug-in, uh, you can look at my video on positioning if it seems too daunting or too complex at first to you know, constantly looking for which beater is where. Um, you can also use the field lines as uh, sort of a half measure towards getting to this optimal goal. So if, you're the, if, you, if there's another person on your side of the field, you should definitely be crossing midfield um, as, you, as you move up with a team as they transition going uh, forward on offense. And if you're further down, closer to the defensive side, you might shift all the way down to the goal line, uh, just so you can get those yep. two angles on the pitch. Completely agree, and I I do support that plug. You guys should watch more of Chris's videos if you're watching this one. Dude, just watch the rest. Um, yeah, and I think the the last point I want to make as far as movement, you need to be watching right the beaters just as much as the bludgers. So if one of the balls goes way out of play you need to transition at least one beat ref over to kind of observe what's happening with that right so if one of the balls goes off pitch try to stop it as soon as it's past the boundary line right don't, don't stop it in the pitch but as soon as it goes off pitch try to stop it so it doesn't roll you know 100 feet away that that's not good for the sport it's not good for anybody playing if there is more than one person actively traveling to try and get that ball you need to get over there you need to watch because loose balls and physicality around them are very very often areas where, where fouls can occur little shoulder bumps little things maybe a little behind the back contact you want to be over there near it instead of just staying with where the overall waffle play is happening 
Right. Uh, you'll see charges, body blocks, or people trying to body block that end up being charges. Nope. Yep. Um, quite a few pushes from behind to try and get people over the hard boundary. That's a pretty common thing to see. That's a very big one, especially in the beating game, um, because so often the beat refs are, are kind of sucked into where the play is happening. There's a lot of area for a player to take advantage when they're running for, for one of those loose bludgers away from the quaffle game. So you want to try and mitigate that by, you know, watching what's going on, moving over there. Marty, your next ad, uh, piece of advice for ARs is to watch the beaters and their balls. Yeah, so we, we kind of touched it a little bit at the end there, but I, I really wanted to make its own slide to, to, to stress this, right? Not just the beaters, also their balls all the time, right? Um, at the end of the day, we talked about the HR and the LAR, right? And one of them is watching the quaffle, the other one's watching off-ball chasers. You're just as likely to get or see a foul um, with beaters without bludger as you are to see with beaters with a bludger, right? It's a physical game, it's a contact sport. People are gonna be pushing, shoving. So watch for the ball that's on the ground, watch for the beaters moving around towards it. Make sure you're in the area to make a call. In addition, I need to stress this again because I know we touched it early, but if you are an AR, your job is the beaters and their balls. Your job is not the quaffle. Your job is not seeing if a goal went in or not. You're not. Your job is not on stitch on pitch seeing if a catch was good. Your job is seeing if the person was beat before or not. Right. That's that's your number one thing. You got to watch the beaters, watch the balls that are in the air, and make sure you're able to make a call every time. Um, the the one of the worst feelings as a player in this sport, especially as a beater in this sport. Is to see is to is to hit someone square in the side, square in the chest, right? They keep playing, and you turn to a rep, and they're like, "My guy," and they're just like, oh, "I wasn't watching." I'm like, "Then why are you here?" That's that's your only job <laughs> is to watch. Like, come on, <laughs> like you need to be there. You need to be watching the beaters of the balls. You need to just push that chaser game out of your head as much as you can. Right, like 50% you're mad at the person who is ignoring a beat, but also, hey ref, yeah, yeah, where are you? Yeah, it's 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 pretty pretty demoralizing as a player to to make a play, know you did something, have it be very effective in in the overall grand scheme of things, and to turn to a ref to try and get support, and then just being like, yeah, I wasn't watching. It just I was I was distracted. Like that's that's really rough. Next up, uh, your next piece of advice for assistant refs is to talk. Yeah, so um, oddly enough, seeing a foul doesn't do anything for players if you don't talk about it, right? Um, seeing a beat doesn't actually mean that the player is going to get off room unless you say beat, right? Um, super, super important, not just for ARs, for any ref, to enunciate and be very, very loud and vocal at all times when you're on the pitch, right? Um, I'm, I'm a loud person by nature, but some people who, who step into the refing field aren't, right? They're not used to it. They don't they don't maybe have to yell at a bunch of employees every day because they're in a big warehouse and people can't hear, right? I'm, I'm used to it because that's, that's just the nature of, of my career right now. But if you don't come from a sports background or you, you don't come from a, a work background where you have to speak loudly to large groups on a regular basis, right? You might not be used to projecting your voice, right? Um, as a ref, that is paramount. Um, Players are, are going crazy. There's a million things happening. There's literally four balls on the field at all times, right? If you're not loud, there are many times where a beater or who's a chaser, anybody really, could get skimmed by a ball, have no idea. Could, it's not really expected for them to feel every single one. And if you're not loud and telling them, they're, they're just going to keep playing and, and it can quickly move to a position where maybe that player is now impacting play illegally in no way, shape, or form their fault because they just couldn't hear and couldn't tell, it is your job to kind of prevent those situations. Really be loud, get in their face if you can, right? Wave at them, do something, but use their number. If you know their name, use the name. I know a lot of times you might not, but like anything you can do to get the information across that person, really try to do it, right? That is ultimately our job as beat refs is to be as vocal as possible and make sure people know when they're going to be. Right. Even you decide you, when they're safe. Yeah. I was going to say, even using the position and the team, is, we'll get it. 100 percent yeah i can get the message across um i just meant like also on the flip side make sure your safe calls and things like that your no foul calls are just as loud as your foul calls um oftentimes it can be really difficult for a beater in the middle of a duel to like 
know whether they were safe or or beat don't make them guess right like that that that's bad for both people involved in the in in the interaction right the person who threw it is like are we good am i able to go for the ball the person who's hit is like can i keep playing it is really really important to, to make it clear to everybody as soon as possible right and when something like that happens i would always recommend calling the safe or the clear person first and then calling the beats i agree completely next piece of advice is to use back to hoops yeah so i think this gets brought up every once in a while um in aqd iqa all, all kinds of forms but i think it's something that really needs to be touched on and explained to reps um as they come into the sport as they come into really any sport not just quidditch but it's, it's really big for for um quidditch specifically because of kind of the way a lot of our fouls are educated but at the end of the day you shouldn't be calling every single foul you see right um our goal as a ref is to facilitate a safe, fun, and enjoyable playing and fair playing experience for both teams, right? Um, all of those things are important, not just the, the fair part, um, not just the safe part, but also the enjoyable part, right? The, the pace of the game is important. Letting people play the game is important. You, you can't make the game about yourself. You can't be out there just to try and give as many cards as you want, just to try and prove you know the rules as as, as well as anybody else, right? That's that's not your job. There are plenty um, of refs who wear cards as badges of honor. They'll, I've had refs come up to me after a game and tell them, you know, say, I've given 21 cards in that game. And then my next question is, how? You, like, like, I don't you, think I would even see 21 fouls in a game, let alone right? And, and And you got to ask yourself, like, how could anybody playing that game enjoy the game? Because right. Even if, even if you're giving like two cards at a time once in a while, that's like 15 to 20 stoppages of play. Like it's a 20 minute game before sit down pitch. Like you're, you're stopping the play, like stopping every single offense. Like that's that's not quidditch, right? You're supposed to be able to go back and forth. Back. There's, there's no opportunity to actually enjoy the game at that point. You're, you're really stripping a lot of what quidditch is, a lot of the flow out of it. And, and just kind of draining it from the game. It's, it's not good and it's not it's not a positive inter uh, interaction for any of the players. Right, no team can build momentum and get the hype behind them, get that hype train rolling. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so just specifically when it comes to this, right, um, our sport has, you know, back to hoops, has that kind of no harm, no foul scenario. Um, it it kind of goes hand in hand, right? No harm, no foul is, is when you see something that was technically illegal, but didn't really affect play in any way, shape, or form. So you just you just let people play. Back to hoops is the the next step of that, where it's clearly the player tried to to stop what they were doing that was legal. Maybe it was like behind the back contact or something like that, right? They initiated contact accidentally. The player got an extra step on them, and as soon as they noticed, they immediately let go. It might have slowed the player down by a step, but you think that player can still effectively do the offense, and you don't really think it's needed to give a card use that back to hoops um and and try to let play continue if from there you know that player stump the player who was fouled stumbles or, or it clearly becomes apparent that that foul did have a serious impact then you can stop play issue a blue issue a yellow whatever you see fit and and give them the reset but try to give the opportunity for the back to hoops to do do the job for you so that everybody else can continue in the game and flow um, I think that happens a lot more in the beater game than, than in the chaser game because there's a lot of times where someone will, you know, get beat, they'll turn, and they'll roll it a couple, they'll, they'll roll the ball a little bit. Um, if you see that, literally just, just, you say back to hoops, go over and turn the ball over, turn the bludger over. I know officially, right, you're not supposed, you're supposed to stop play to turn the, the ball over. You don't need to, right? It, realistically, no one is going to be upset that instead of stopping play and giving a card, you send someone back to hoops and roll the bludger, right? It, it's common sense. It lets the play continue, and it allows for play to develop in a much more natural and enjoyable way for everybody involved than blowing that whistle, demanding a card does every single time. Right, and for actually for turnovers, um, except for the reset turnover, you don't have to stop play for them. You can yeah. just go ahead and adjudicate them right away. Um, so, and another thing is that throwing after being beat, um, if it's a little bit longer than natural motion, but not quite long enough for the blue card, that's just yep. a turnover. So, you know, AR, exactly. you can use that. Yeah, 
And I think I think it's really important to use those back to hoops, use those turnovers without stopping play. It'll it'll make everybody enjoy the game a lot more, and it'll just let the flow continue more naturally. All right. So when would you give a card? Um, great call. So a couple times that you should be giving a card, um, pretty much no matter what. Um, top one is when the interaction affected play in a serious way. Right. At the end of the day, intent can be important and it cannot be important. Like, you, you can have your opinions on intent, but at the end of the day, if something somebody did affected the game, affected the play in a serious manner, like stopped the team from being able to score, um, stopped a turnover, stopped a, a opportunity for a fast break, you need to stop play, you need to educate a foul, you need to give the proper turnover and allow that team who got fouled uh, a more fair chance to actually proceed with the game. That's, that's one. Next one um, would be repeat offenses, right? So, like I said, I want you guys to use back to hoops, use um, just the no harm, no foul, that kind of stuff. Use warnings as much as you can. That only goes so far. If you warn someone once or twice on a minor foul and this is your third or fourth time going for it, you need to give a card, right? Um, even if it doesn't affect play much each individual time, getting an extra step towards rolling a ball back to your own hoops four times, like, it matters. It slows down play for the other team. It it slowly wears on the other team. Is like, hey, I know it didn't really affect right now, but like, I'm having to do this every single time. That's unfair. That's not what should be happening. So, so at a certain point, right? Usually after two or three, uh, or usually on the second or third time for one of those minor fail fouls, I'll I'll stop and be like, nope, you've been warned. You're getting a card here. Um, it's going to depend on the severity of the foul. Whether I give a single warning or two warnings before I go to the card, and that's kind of subjective. Um, but an example I'll give you guys is someone not fully dismounting, right, before tagging and proceeding, right? They they kind of turn around, they get beat near their hoops, they tag in without dismounting. The correct procedure is make them remount, or make them re-go through the knockout procedure, right? I'll have them do that the first time. I'll have them do that even the second time. Third time they're doing it, I'm going to ask for a blue card because it is unacceptable for someone to ignore kind of your, your your rulings and not listen to you or the ref crew that many times, right? So third time, going to the box. Um, something a point, little bit. I would say at that point, if they have ignored you, basically ignored you and the rule book twice, they are ignoring referee directives at that yeah. point. 100%. And, so, and if I think they're doing it egregiously or... Like, because there's times where people just aren't thinking it right next to their hoops, right? That's when I'll do the blue. If they're doing it very egregiously and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to see if the refs aren't watching and I'll keep trying to get away with it. That's when you lean more on the yellow card for, to your point, like intentionally ignoring refs, intentionally like trying to get around the rules. Right. Absolutely. And then the last point you have here about uh, reckless play. Yeah. So that's, that's really important. Um, as a athlete, it is your job to control yourself in a reasonable manner while playing, right? You should never be putting yourself or other players in a dangerous situation through your actions, right? So whether that means, you know, diving towards a quaffle on the ground as someone was winding up for a kick, right? It's similar to soccer, right? You put your head for like, if you're trying to head a ball while someone's in the motion of kicking, it's dangerous, not because you're putting them at risk, but because you're putting yourself at harm and forcing them to try and change what they're doing. Um, or if you're just, you know, blindly, recklessly charging at somebody, trying to hit them and not caring how you're controlling yourself, right? Anytime your actions could under most normal circumstances result in an injury or would likely result in injury or just a general dangerous area of play, a foul should be educated because that player is not playing with a safe mindset, right? It right. is everybody's job to take safety seriously. Um, it's everybody's job to control themselves. If you're playing dangerously or recklessly, you should be called for it and you should be getting a card. Like those are things that can't be acceptable because you know safety has to be number one, like obviously, fairness and enjoyability are important for a sport. Safety is the top one when it comes to a contact sport for sure. One thing I want to point out that I really like that you added, because I've made this call exactly only once, but I feel like most refs don't know it, is that playing dangerously doesn't just mean putting other people at danger. If you're yep. putting yourself at danger, the referees can and should adjudicate a foul against you. You should not, you should not be putting yourself at, at risk. Um, yeah, I, I actually, 
I got I got that card not footage uh, in soccer in, in high school. I kind of laid out and dove to try and head a ball that like a guy was literally in the process of winding up to kick. And like he didn't hit me, which was was nice of him. But I 100% put myself in a dangerous position there. I put him in a position where he had to either just like abruptly stop his action or hurt me. Like it, it wasn't a good choice. I, I mean, I was, I, was a, I was a kid. I was just trying to hit the ball, right? But it's not smart, and it should 100% be called out and educated. Out next, in big bold letters here, confident. <laughs> and I cannot express how much I agree with you here. Yeah, so um, something, something everybody who's ever gone to RPI and played with me should know, uh, confidence is key, right? In, in all things, um, as a player, as a rep, in life in general, right, you should be confident. But specifically to refing, you you need to have confidence in what you're doing. Um, the players shouldn't be making the calls, right? That's that's our job as refs. We need to be doing that. You shouldn't you shouldn't be swayed by what the players are saying. And so as far as you going to start a call, and once you've made a call, you shouldn't be swayed by what they're saying to either take it back or to not call it. In the Right. right. Uh, What's the point of you being even being there if you're just going to listen to what the players say? Hundred percent. Right. Uh, your job is to, is to go into that game and to present a, a bastion of control. Right. You need to be there to confidently educate and control the game. If it starts with the refs, right? If as far as a game getting out of hand, getting nitty gritty, we've all been there. We've all seen games where you know. One team's a little physical, the other team gets a little emotional, it goes back and forth and things can kind of explode and elevate all the way up to like just, you know, like fights and things like that. A lot of that can be prevented by quick, swift, and confident action from a rep, right? If you present yourself as like, no, this is what's happening, you need to stop. A lot of times people respond to that authority, that confidence with de-escalation, right? That's obviously you're gonna get those one-offs where people go nuts, but like it's gonna really prevent a lot of those issues and um, it's going to instill a level of trust in the rep group, which is really important, right? Um, very, very often, right, coaches and captains will turn to a rep and be like, hey, did you see that? Hey, to an exper inexperienced beat rep, like, why, why aren't you watching that? What are, and if you turn back with anything other than a, I saw it, it wasn't a foul, I'm paying attention. If you turn back with a, oh, I, I didn't think, uh, like, you're going to get yelled at for the rest of the game. And that's bad for two reasons. One, you know, it's going to distract you from what's going on. Two, you're just, you know, upsetting an entire half of the game for no reason, right? And it, and you might have been right the entire time, but if you didn't present it in that fashion, if you didn't present it with confidence, it's going to lead to a lot of that just back and forth between you and, and players or you and coaches. Well, especially when you aren't right is when the confidence kicks in. If yes. You, if you confidently yeah. make a, the wrong call, you will have a much better time than if you make the right call but you don't do it confidently 100 percent, and that's that's definitely something i want to touch on right um no matter how good you are right like i like everybody makes mistakes as the ref like we're, we're human to to be human is to error right like you, you can't be perfect all the time maybe you get one game perfect at a tournament chances are you won't even get that much right um, right there are gonna be little things that you just you can't literally watch everything no matter how good you are you can't get the perfect angle every single time. Like sometimes you're gonna make a wrong call. What's important when those things happen is you go by what you saw, right? Like what you actually interpreted to have occurred and you stick to it and you confidently present it that way, right? Um, let's say you're, you're kind of, there's a beater play going on, you're a little bit to the side, you see a beat come and you can't quite tell if it hit the, the other team's beater, but based on the way it bounced off, it seems pretty clear to you that it hit them in the leg or whatever, and, and just reasonably you're calling the beat. People freak out, whatnot, you're like, no, I saw it, it changed direction, this guy is beat straight up, we're not arguing about it, right? We present in that fashion, things move on, people, people like, they will internalize and be a little upset that they think they got cheated, but they're they're not gonna be like screaming at the ref for the rest of the game because they're like, no, they're, that's what the ref saw, that's, what, that's what's happening, we're moving on, right? If it's, well, I think you got beat. Um, I'm gonna need you to go back to who's like. Then, then you open the door for a back and forth between you and the player, and a back and forth throughout the game between you and, and a team. Um, and you don't want to do that. Right. It's not a very few fouls, and by very few, I think of I can't think of an example, but I just don't want to rule it out. Our conversations between yeah. the refs and the teams. It's just it happened. Sorry. 
Yep, 100%. And I will say this, um, as a ref, and I, th I don't think I actually put this anywhere, but I think it's an important to note. Just because you've made a call, just because you've communicated it, doesn't mean you're right, right? And the players and the coaches do deserve a chance to say something about it, right? As a ref, you shouldn't be sitting there thinking, hey, if I do my job right, nobody should talk to me and I, I don't have to listen to them. You should be open to feedback during a game and at the end of the game. The way that should happen is if they bring something to you, listen, keep the conversation short and end it with, thank you, I'll watch for it or thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll be looking for that. Like something in that manner that lets them know you've heard them and you're actually thinking about it for the rest of the game, right? Doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out of your way to do any of that, but like, there will be times where a ref, um, or a, a coach, I should say, comes up to me as a ref and says, hey, can you watch um, the other team? I don't think they're fully dismounted, right? Whether or not they're they're right about that, I will, you know, check on the other team, just just do a quick glance, make sure the next couple plays as they're, they're getting off the room, I'll take a look. I'm not going to change the way I've been refing. If I saw something earlier, I would have called it. If I saw something later, I'll call it. But you can still kind of look out for it, right? You're not going to be playing perfect every game. You're not going to be repping perfect every game. Take the advice when you get it and keep the game moving. Right. I mean, if you think about the number of rules you have to keep in your head at one time, I mean, the rule books, oh, yeah. what, or, oh I mean, easily over 100 pages. I mean, for there's sure. a lot of rules for any ref to be keeping in mind. So it's very likely you won't be thinking about a specific rule when that rule comes up. And so yeah. honestly, I usually, I'm usually grateful when a captain says, hey, can you watch for this? Because, well, I might, oh yeah, I know that back contact is illegal, but it's it's sometimes the little cue of maybe I wasn't watching for it. Like, I know it's illegal. I know you can't do it, but maybe I wasn't watching for it. And now I need to go watch for it. 100%, right? And that's that's one of the beauties of the, the ref meeting. And actually, anytime I HR, I actually ask my entire ref crew to come over when the captains are asking about those kinds of things in the beginning, because I like to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, Oftentimes, teams know enough about their own team and the, the team they're playing against, especially in, in high-profile games, to know what things don't get called frequently, right? Um, whether it's a team that likes to kind of manipulate immunity a little bit, or a team that, or your own team likes to kick beat, so you're asking your refs to watch for it. Rather than you listening to that yourself as an HR and then trying to remember each little thing and communicate it, I like to bring the whole AR team over, whole LAR, snitch ref, everything, so they can hear those few calls and actually think about them during the game. Right, I think that's a great idea. If the captains ask you to watch for something as a head ref that's really in the beater game, call your ARs over. I like that. 100%. Your next piece of advice is for them to stick to the facts. Now, this sounds like you're a lawyer about to interview a witness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for an AR, right, a lot of times, I mean, Straight up, you can't give a card, right? You're, you're not the one giving it. You have to communicate to the HR. They have to stop play something. They then go, go and actually give out the card, right? So no matter what, you have to go through an intermediary to actually stop play and make any kind of foul happen. When doing that, it should be short, sweet, simple, right? Like you need to stick to the point, tell them specifically what you what you saw, right? Um, that play, uh, beater number seven uh, on team black, he, when he was trying to take the ball from beater number eight on team white, uh, his arm came in contact with the neck. It should be a yellow card if I think it was egregious or it affected play seriously. It should be a blue card if I think it was very minor accidental and he agitated it, right? But I, and, and I don't think it affected play much, right? So we go one, up. One point there, just with physical contact fouls, you can't give a blue card, unfortunately. It's either a yellow or it's a back to hoops. Valid. You're, you're, you're very right. Um, so yellow in that case, I'm just on the spot trying to think and I'm not great at remembering all the rules as I'm going quickly, but you know, you're very right. Um, but like, that's my point, right? You go up to them, you go up to the ref and go, Hey, this is a specific thing I call. It should be this card. The end, right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't be going, they, they, the head ref should never have to go. Are you sure you saw that? Like step up confidently say, this is the thing that occurred. This is what should happen. Um, to the point of what just happened there, right? Maybe I tell you that and then you as the HR, because you know, the HR should know a little bit more about the rules as a whole says, well, actually that foul is a yellow. Cool, thank you, the end, right? That's the whole conversation, right? right. It shouldn't be one of those, well, hey, head ref, I think that player um, kind of hit them from behind the back. I'm not really sure. I, what do you want to do? Like that should never be happening. You should be going up there, 
with an actual situation in mind, communicating it clearly, trying to get play going again, right? There is so many times in our sport where a stoppage of play leads to a ref huddle for like a minute. Right. And that, that should never happen. That's that's unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. The only time maybe you spend more time than 15 to 20 seconds on a ref huddle is on a snitch call because there were crazy beater things happening at the same time. That's like the only time I find that acceptable in a game. For the rest of the game, 10 to 20 seconds max, go out and make your call. Right. Uh, my rule of thumb for like simple foul calls, like a neck contact foul, is about 30 seconds whistle to whistle on the stoppage. Um, or at least from at least it should not be the ref's fault if it goes beyond 30 seconds, right? If a player is injured, you gotta, you know, you have to wait. Yeah, yeah. No, you for sure. To get better faster. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. And and sometimes, and, and this is a good point, right? It's it's ref controllable, right? Every once in a while, you get a captain or someone who comes out and is yelling is a rate about the the foul that you guys are calling. That's going to happen. It's sports. People are going to get emotional. Again, you do still need to try and keep the game moving, right? Give them a chance to once state their whatever whatever grievance they had, respond to it, say, okay, I understand, I'll watch for it, respond to it in some manner, and then say, however, we need to keep this game going, please move to the sideline, right? We can talk about it after, we can do things, like, whatever. You got to keep them controlled, right? And you got to let the game continue to move. Right. And uh, for speaking concisely, I mean, depending on the head ref, like, as a head referee, I want the, the least amount of information that I need to make a call from an AR. So um, Laura Ivy is someone who does this a lot and she does it really well. When she stops play for a foul as an assistant referee or asks for play to be stopped. And yep. when she comes up to me, she'll literally just, she'll just say, you know, number 39, black team, contact from behind. And that's it. That's all that that, that I hear. And I go, okay, great. And then the, the card comes out. Um, Perfect. And then if you add maybe the yellow or the blue, that's also great. But yeah, just the the more concise you can be and the more confident you can be, the easier it is for the head ref to to call it. 100%. I think me personally, the reason I say a card afterwards more often than not, um, for me is because I found the last two years, a lot of the times I've been ARing has been at like Northeast regionals or, or games in the Northeast, MQC games, where the HR is clearly like less experienced or maybe doing a training, things like that. So I'm trying to support a little bit, take a little bit off their plate and like make that decision making process a little simpler. Um, oftentimes when I have an experienced ref like yourself or like Ethan Sturm or Jake or someone, it'll just be literally, hey, this is the foul, this is the player and I'll, I'll move away. So I, I do think that's a really good call out. All right, now last but not least. So their last piece of advice here is consistency, which if you've ever heard me talk about the four cornerstones of officiating, this is the most important one. Yep, I uh, like to finish finish on a high note. It's it's big, right? Um, you should never find yourself at a point in the game calling a foul on on team A that you completely ignored for team B in the beginning, right? Um, you you need to be from start to finish of a game, and ideally from start to finish of a tournament, consistent with the way you are calling the rules. Um, in Quidditch, especially as a beat ref, that can be a little harder because oftentimes you're focused on one section of beaters and the other beat refs are fo focused on the others because you're, you're kind of splitting up that task management so that everything gets called. Make sure you spend a little bit of time before the game um, actually touching base with the other airs and make sure you're on, on the same page with things like... Um, it's, it's a lot more clear now, but in the past, like a ball rolling off pitch, what should be happening with it? There's a little bit more gray in the past. So that was something I always like to touch base with my ARs about and make sure we're on the same page. Now, the rule is specific, but sometimes people don't know it. So I'll like to remind them like, hey, you know, if play stops, bring that in the two meters or sorry, two yards. Make sure make sure you're you're paying attention to where it went off pitch and you're 100% you're of the time telling somebody it's their ball to go inbound, things like that. Make sure everybody's on the same page with those rules and ready to call them the same way is really important. That's the pre-shift, pre pre-game pre meeting you should be touching base. During the game though, if you hear one of your peers give a warning for something, right? Um, and it may be something that you wouldn't normally give a warning for, um, but whatever, they're giving a warning. Or on the flip side, maybe they aren't giving a warning and you usually would. Mirror that, right? Um, don't let them do it once to one team and then you do your normal thing for the other team and make it imbalanced. Uh, for better or for worse, 
by doing it the same way, you're giving that consistency so that at least both teams feel they're being treated the same, right? Even if they both feel they're being treated a little bit worse than they should, or they're getting away with a little bit more than they should, they know they're both going to get the same treatment. And that's super important. Right. If you're consistently calling, I mean, even if you just threw out the Quidditch rule book and consistently called the rules of basketball, like people could eventually figure out what it is they're supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, but if you are calling the rules of basketball one minute, the rules of Quidditch the next, and then suddenly you're switching to like the wrestling rule book, people have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Players shouldn't have to guess um, if what they're doing is okay or not. Never. They should never have to guess that, right? And I mean, those are extreme examples, but within the rulebook, it's better to be consistently lax or consistently strict than it is to switch between the two mid-game. 100%. Thank you so much, Mario, for imparting your knowledge upon us during this three-part series. I've learned a lot from making these videos, and I hope you all learn a lot from watching them. Please like and subscribe and leave a comment if you have any questions. Join me again on Thursday for my next video, which is one you won't want to miss. In the meantime, please travel safely, and as always, thank you for watching.